We have to keep borrowing to sustain this bubble because there's no real manufacturing left in this country. The military is absolutely, from a manpower standpoint, on the verge of collapse. I have said that a draft is inevitable. Oil discoveries have been in progressive decline since 1962. All of this translates into war, famine, pestilence, plague, economic collapse. You name the words, they all apply. Insanity is repeating the same actions over and over again, expecting different results. You spend dollars to get energy to work for you. If there is no energy, money ultimately becomes valueless. It says very clearly it takes 30 years to change the energy infrastructure. The truth is our ammunition. The truth and the people will prevail. Denial stops here. Despite many personal sacrifices and hardships, my work Rupert has worked hard on our behalf. An honors graduate of political science at UCLA. He came from the LA police force as an intern in 1969, rose through the ranks to become an officer in 1973. A former LAPD narcotics investigator and CIA crack cocaine whistleblower. Mike Gruber, through his painstaking, dogged, and intelligent research, has done more to unearth, collate, synthesize, and interrelate data concerning the inner workings of our government since the late 90s than anyone I've studied. The founder, publisher, and editor of FromTheWilderness.com. Our, our questioners, I'm going to introduce them briefly, and then we will entertain one question from each questioner. We're, Mike Rupert, who is from The Wilderness. Mike. Let's have a big welcome for Michael Rupert. Ladies and gentlemen, Mike Rupert. Ladies and gentlemen, Mike Rupert. The only thing that matters to me is change in the political and economic landscape. And failing that, the only thing that matters to me is saving human life, period. That's how my success is, is, or failure is measured. And that's all I care about. And when I go to sleep at night, that's all I think about. What I'm going to show you tonight will mean a lot more uh, to you than, uh, than to the people who are new to this. That doesn't mean that the people who are new to this aren't going to walk away needing a stiff drink. Because the stuff we talk about evokes usually one human response, which is fear, which has many kinds of uh, manifestations. Sometimes it's denial, which is not a river in Egypt. Uh, sometimes it's... Uh, hostility, sometimes it's anger, sometimes it's uh, shock. And I come from a military uh, and in, in intelligence background where efficacy and performance on the field of battle is what counts. If you know me or if you've walked, looked at our writings at FTW, you know, you know that we never present anything to you that is not fully sourced. If you've read Crossing the Rubicon, you've seen the thousand footnotes at the end of the book. I don't ask you to take anything at face value. I say, here's what I say, and here's the proof for what I say. I've been walking these halls since 1979, and I first came to Congress looking for help because my life was in danger. That was a lot more real to me than some academic discussion. I was a whistleblower with LAPD. I needed help from Congress because I caught my government doing something wrong. I've been walking these hills every year since. And I'm sorry, but I see a dissent, and you have described if you will, a disease state of a republic, whatever you want to call it, descending. And this is a historical question for anybody who wants to take it. Any of you historians out there, have any of you ever seen a nation or an empire at the pinnacle of power, whether it be Rome, France, Spain, Britain, anywhere else, descend down a road to totalitarianism and on its own voluntarily decide to turn around? Crossing the Rubicon is a detective story. It gets to the innermost core of the 9-11 attacks. It places 9-11 at the center of a desperate new America, created by specific named individuals in preparation for peak oil, an economic crisis like nothing the world has ever seen. Rubicon is not only a, a book about 9-11, it's a book about peak oil. It's a map which, if you read it and study it, will help you study the landscape that you're walking on now. Being a practical guy, I mean, I'm an ex-policeman. I used to work on the street. I've been shot. You know, I've been in life and death situations. So for me, things, some things are cut and dried. If something doesn't work, you try something else. That makes sense? Because over our history now, which is seven and a half plus years, we've batted about 800 
in terms of our predictions and our analysis. Now, Ted Williams only had to bat 400, as Catherine Austin Fitz says, and he was the best guy that ever stepped up to the plate. We batted about 800. For me, the issue is no longer about saving the world. The world doesn't want to be saved. Get it? I'm here to save you. I got 27, 28 years of trying to change the government. It didn't work. But we did make a lot of friends, and we did teach some people about how the government works. I want to empower you to understand the things that you have to do to protect yourself, because nobody's going to do it for you. And we draw you a map. And the purpose of drawing you a map is so that you don't have to come to Mike Rupert to tell you what's going on. It's to give you the map and teach you how to read it so that when stuff comes your way, you can find your own way out of the wilderness. But this is no longer about saving the world. This is no longer about having a, a lefty, progressive, feel-good party and rally and where we can clap and cheer and throw some money at something and go home and think we've done something. I don't know about you, but I spent 27 years of my life trying to change the world, and I've been an abject failure. How well have you done? Viewed from almost any perspective, be it geopolitics, economics, climate, spreading of warfare, the threat to unleash a global orgy of bloodletting, rising energy prices, documented energy shortages, fresh water shortages, biological warfare, the repression of civil, civil liberties at home and abroad, or any of a dozen, dozen other issues, planet Earth and all of its inhabitants are in great danger. It's more important to worry about the danger that's coming rather than the one that's just passed. But we're going to talk about 9-11, because in talking about 9-11, we're going to talk about how it was perpetrated, because if you understand the how and the mechanisms by which government, press, the economy, the banking system, the world uh, political landscape were manipulated to produce a 9-11, you will have a clue as to how all of those factors can be manipulated again to produce events that are yet to come, some of which we don't know what they are yet. But it's important to understand how clear-cut the case is. There is a herd of angry elephants that happens to be charging at us right now in the form of peak oil in the form of economic collapse, in the form of climate collapse, in the form of fascist totalitarianism, totalitarianism, pending world conflict, and a whole bunch of other things which we're going to talk about tonight. So what I'm here to do tonight is to help you breathe better in the face of what's coming. Then you can help somebody else, and it will probably be your neighbor, people close to you. I'm not trying to save my country anymore. My country doesn't exist anymore. We're going to begin our questioning with Representative McKinney. Thank you. And I really, well, I have a ton of questions. But um, I think it's more important that I just make a statement. And that is how compelling and thoroughly researched your testimony has been today how absolutely moving it was to hear your husband's voice so that we have the opportunity to touch and feel as best we can a little bit of what you feel, what you must feel. And those feelings then compel you to ask questions, to seek answers, and you deserve to have those answers. I just want to thank you so much, the three of you, Lori, Mindy, and Monica, for being here with us today and enlightening us and sharing with us a little bit of your pain and of your patriotism to want the best out of your government, our government, and for the future of our country. Thank you very much. We'll begin our questioning now. Mike Rupert. 
This is difficult for many of us and somewhat cathartic even all this time after the attacks. And I think I speak for many people in this room to express my gratitude uh, to you because it's apparent that you have not stopped digging even after the release of the Kane Commission report and uh, your position seemed to have changed a great deal since then. In order to establish a murder conviction or a homicide conviction, you have to establish means, motive, and opportunity. Three elements of the crime. This is a court case that I would take to trial anywhere. And in order to get a conviction for murder, you have to show means, motive, and opportunity. The deepest secrets of September the 11th lie in the Vice, President, the Vice President's National Energy Policy Development Group. It was a task force. Uh, instituted by the Bush administration in January of 2001, right after they took office. It met in secret until May of 2001. You may have heard little stories about they won't release their records, it went to the Supreme Court, they won't tell anybody what they were talking about. That tax task force, which was paid for by your money, which Dick Cheney and the Bush administration have refused to release. Uh, when the first decision came up before the Supreme Court, Dick Cheney took Justice Antonin Scalia duck hunting in Louisiana at taxpayer expense on a Secret Service airplane. Conflict of slight interest. And finally, again, that was just confirmed about, this is just from like a week ago, this is uh, May 11th, okay, less than, about three weeks ago. Cheney wins the final court ruling. We will never know what they discussed, although in crossing the Rubicon, we did discuss seven pages of records. They were discussing who had the oil, where the oil fields were, who owned what, wh whom we had to bribe, who we had to kill, whatever we had to do to get the oil. We have that little glimpse. Secret Service is the superordinate agency in the entire United States government in national emergency situations overriding the military, everything. And Dick Cheney and the Secret Service were in the Presidential Emergency Operations Center, the bunker beneath the White House, while Richard Clark was in the crisis room upstairs. And they had completely separate and redundant command and control systems to override every other radar, radio, and everything else that was operating so that the attacks could take place. The 9-11 attacks were the result of deliberate planning and orchestrated efforts by identifiable leaders within the United States government and the energy and financial sectors of this economy to see a Pearl Harbor-like attack which would provide the American empire with a pretext for war, invasion, and the sequential confiscation of oil and natural gas reserves or the key transportation routes through which they passed. 9-11 was a premeditated murder. The next great struggle, conflict, that the U.S. had to get involved in was to seize and control the Eurasian continent, in part mostly because of its oil wealth, and that includes the Middle East. The larger circle on the outside, the one that looks like a dashed line, is where he said the next war was going to break out. Is that a little suspicious to you? Possibly? But what I show you with the means, motive, and opportunity on 9-11, here's the motive for the crime. Peak oil. Oil and natural gas are indispensable to our way of life. The world is beginning to run out of hydrocarbon energy, period. We're going to talk about that later on. But that motive, which I will expand upon and tell you about, is the motive for the reason why the United States government orchestrated and conducted the attacks of September the 11th. Where is all the oil in the world, and who do we have to deal with, bribe, kill, or make friends, or blackmail to get it? Now, as you put the maps that came out of NAPDG together, this is a map I constructed from their maps, because I had to do a cut and paste overlay, but this is the oil fields they were looking at. Now, I want you to understand something. That right there, ladies and gentlemen, is 60% of all the recoverable oil on planet Earth. 60%. If you overlay that to the state of Texas, you see roughly the size of the area. U.S. oil production peaked in 1970, has been in steady decline. He said, as a general rule, oil production generally peaks about 40 years after discovery peaks. Once you pass this peak, no matter how much money, science, effort, prayer, animal sacrifices in the backyard, I don't care, you will never produce any more oil than you do at this peak, and nothing will change that. And there is an abundance of scientific evidence to show that this is the case. In about a hundred years, mankind has used roughly half of all the oil that nature placed on this planet. 
there was clear knowledge that this crisis was coming a long time before 9-11. I know that Dick Cheney knew. That's also established in the book. And of course, he came from Halliburton. The means was the fact that in, also in May and June of 2001, all war game exercise planning and preparation for terrorist attacks was placed under the direct control of the Vice President of the United States, pursuant to White House executive order. It's on the White House website. Richard Cheney took control of all military war game exercises. The attacks of 9-11 were accomplished through an amazing orchestration of logistics and personnel. Former National Security Aid and Counter-Terror Advisor Richard Clark has postulated that such a conspiracy could never be kept a secret. Too many people, he said, would have had to have been involved. On this point, I disagree with Clark completely and point to the fact that the Manhattan Project, which developed the, the atom bomb and the stealth fighter project, were both successfully kept secret. The numbers of people involved in both of those projects far exceeded the numbers of people within the United States government required to execute September the 11th. September 11th was an attack on the United States of America that was controlled. It was orchestrated and executed by the United States government. So that the United States of America had the means, motive, and opportunity to create attacks which gave the government the pretext to invade Afghanistan, Iraq, to sequentially move to control the last remaining oil reserves on the planet. The United States Secret Service is the supreme U.S. agency for operational control with complete authority over the military and all civilian agencies. Dick Cheney was the acting commander-in-chief on 9-11 calling the shots via the Secret Service. George Bush was reading about pet goats. George Bush was out of the loop. Where did Cheney go? He went, was rushed right down to the PEOC, the bunker underneath the White House. Dick Cheney had complete control of the entire U.S. government on September the 11th. Not only that, he had it a long time before 9-11, because through the Secret Service and executive orders, he had taken control all of all war game planning and all preparation for a terrorist attack in 2001. So the Secret Service has the legal authority to take supreme command over all agencies in, uh, in the U.S. in times of a national emergency on U.S. soil, even the Air Force. Every agency is subordinate to the Secret Service in what are called national special security events. You can look it up on the web. Secret Service has the highest technological communication systems of any agency, as it should. On 9-11, the Secret Service had the technology to see the FAA radar screens. I found quotes saying that that the Secret Service was watching every hijacked plane, all 22 of them at one time, what they thought were 22 of them at one time, uh, on the screens, seeing in real time exactly what the air traffic controllers were seeing. The bottom line is there were only between eight and 10 fighters left in the Northeast air defense sector, and they all fly in pairs available to respond. The air traffic controllers had 22 possible hijackings on their screens, and they didn't know where to send the fighters. And Dick Cheney was running the whole thing from the basement of the White House, the Presidential Emergency Operations Center, the bunker, beneath the White House with the Secret Service. Secret Service was in the, in the decision-making loop as early as 8.15. We placed them in, uh, in New York City at WTC7. We placed them uh, in the FAA headquarters at that time, no later than 8.45. Everything was in place on 9-11 for the Commander-in-Chief to have full supreme control of the Air Force and all the military via the Secret Service systems and the legal mandate, Bush was doing his thing about goats. 67 times in the calendar year prior to June 1st, 2001, the Air Force was on top of any wayward commercial aircraft that failed to respond to IFR protocols within minutes. Yet on the day of September the 11th, we, they had known that Flight 175 was hijacked for 24 minutes before it hit the Second World Trade Center. They knew it was heading to, and they didn't warn anybody. They knew that Flight 11 had been hijacked for 30 minutes. They didn't scramble. We had Flight 93 uh, flying uh, probably for I think, 35, 40 minutes, knowing it was hijacked. And Flight 77 flying around performing loop-de-loops over the Pentagon in the most heavily protected airspace on the planet. And the fighters just got there too late. That's 9-11, one of the greatest crimes in world history. It has run us over. It was a monstrous, monumental, horrendous crime. It was cold-blooded, premeditated mass murder. Can you just reverse the order and begin again with 
uh, Representative McKinney, and then we'll go to Ring the Governor. Thank you very much. Um, again, I have a uh, comment, and that is, it seems that I it seem to have to say the same thing over and over and over again. Um, and that is, Washington, D.C. seems to be the only place where you can make repeated mistakes at the job, on the job, at the workplace, and get a promotion. Now, I don't understand that. The average person goes to work, they wake up every day, and if they're late five days, they get docked their pay at least, or they may even get fired. So, my question to the panelists is, what does the fact that we have seen promotions instead of punishment for failure, what, if anything, does that tell us about the policy that these people who were promoted were carrying out? I, like many Americans and many people around the world, have serious lingering questions about the collapse of the Twin Towers and what it was that actually struck the Pentagon and what in the name of God it was that caused the collapse of WTC7, World Trade Center 7, a building that wasn't hit by anything. Unfortunately, the physical evidence was quickly destroyed and scientific analysis is not available to us to answer these important questions. Now we come to the wonderful 9-11 Commission. The uh, so-called independent commission is uh, closed. They were a bunch of liars and they're shut down now. Uh, Congress has done nothing about 9-11. The major media has done nothing about 9-11. The legal system is absolutely corrupt. How many people believe that we have a Supreme Court? We have a Republican court. There's no place left to take this. No court anywhere, no nothing. The 9-11 commission, which was full of more conflicts of interest and liars and criminals and crooks than I could possibly imagine, actually fabricated evidence. I got copies of all the original timelines submitted by everybody right after the attacks. In order to make the strongest legal case possible, I have avoided discussions of physical evidence, open to acrimonious debate and scientific challenge, and chosen to do what any good police officer or detective must always do, keep your eye on the suspect. It does not take a scientist to prove that George Bush, Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, Condi Rice, General Ralph Everhart, General Richard Myers, FBI Director Robert Mueller, John Ashcroft, and George Tenet lied to the American people. It occurred to me and it became very clear that everybody in the system knew that Flight 175, the second plane to hit the World Trade Center, had been hijacked and nobody warned the people in the South Tower. And then I found one press account that Don Arias uh, had actually left his post that day to call his brother in the World Trade Center and told him to get out because nobody else was warning anybody. And that was Major Arias' motive for sending me the confirmation. Our next questioner, um, go right to uh, Mike Rupert. Professor Goodman, you and I will uh, forever and strenuously disagree about a couple of things, one of which is your statement that these were blunders and they were personal and not institutional. I, I will go to my grave and I believe my book documents an irrefutable case that uh, the mistakes, quote unquote, made were deliberate, intentional, and they were both personal and systemic. Um, that You made a brief reference to Pearl Harbor, and there's a book by, and I've butchered a couple of first names. I got the last names right today, but uh, Stinnett, I believe his first name is Richard Day of Deceit, uh, with a uh, FOIA release of documents showing that we had broken the Japanese codes prior to Pearl Harbor, knew the attacks were going to take place, and allowed them to happen. I go further with respect to 9-11, uh, arguing that we facilitated the attacks. We'll never agree on that, I, and I stipulate no, never that, agree I on that. wanted to say that. Perhaps we can agree on something. You talked about the deliberate slanting of intelligence, and I'm well familiar with DCI uh, Gates, who was a uh, DDI, I believe, under uh, Bill Casey, Deputy Director of Intelligence. But from Richard Helms all the way through George Tenet, there have been allegations and records indicating that intelligence has been slanted for political purposes. I think we can agree on that. Looking at the 9-11 Commission, the Kane Commission, with these abundant conflicts of interest, uh, I'm particularly taken aback within the last week seeing now this startling new evidence that Iran had something to do with 9-11 after seeing 
20 to 40,000 Iraqi civilians killed in, in, in a, what I think is a useless invasion of Iraq, uh, the, too many deaths of American service personnel. How, in your opinion, was the spin placed or the intelligence placed as a result of these conflicts of interest in the Kane Commission to produce a political result, and what political results have come as a result of the Kane Commission that were purely political? Well, this afternoon I'm going to be talking about uh, the reforms that stem directly from, uh, I think, the ineptitude of the Commission, because these are reforms that will not help the intelligence process. Let me say one thing about the um, intelligence reforms. If you look at the reforms of the 9-11 Commission, would any of those reforms prevented the misuse of intelligence and the politicization of intelligence that were used to lead this country into war? No. Not one of them. If you look at the reforms, would one of those reforms prevent another act of terrorism? No, of course not. Uh, so this is what I worry about, and I share your concern uh, there. My problem is I find that most charges of conspiracy from my 42 years of federal service are really dealing with problems that are what the British call cock-ups and not conspiracy. And I think serious mistakes were made. I don't think they were willful in the case of 9-11 any more than they were in the case of Pearl Harbor. Uh, but this is no time to be debating that. I don't deal in conspiracy theory, I deal in conspiracy fact. Um, say that it's impossible to have a conspiracy of this size with thousands of people knowing and somebody would have talked. And my answer is, you bozos, you buy it the line every time, don't you? In May of 2001, Dick Cheney was placed directly in charge of managing the seamless integration of all training exercises throughout the federal government and military agencies by a presidential directive from the White House. What happened on September the 11th was we had a series of war games, all being conducted simultaneously. Now, if you think back, if you think back about what you may have seen on CNN or NBC or controversy about 9-11 as the hearings went by, you know, you, you've heard that there were tons of warnings available to the government. As a matter of fact, I document about 25 of them, very specific. Five separate war game exercises on September the 11th, which took available National Guard and Air Force fighter aircraft out of the Northeast Air Defense Sector, where all the attacks occurred, moved them to northern Canada and to Alaska. The, what we've just found also moved them to Iceland and Greenland, so there were not enough fighters eight only available, as far as we can tell, in the entire, from Washington, D.C. up to New York City to respond to four hijacked airliners. They fly in pairs. One of my biggest questions would be, you mentioned them in passing, the war game exercises, which we now know were taking place. There were five simultaneous exercises, and I think we'll hear from another presenter today, six, which in effect paralyzed NORAD response on the day of September the 11th. Uh, and you'd also gone to read the footnotes, and I want to comment that uh, I saw uh, uh, Congressman Hamilton, who was the vice chair of the commission on C-SPAN, recently denigrating people who bothered to read the footnotes and point out the inconsistencies, but I thank you for doing that. There is one particular footnote that I will refer to very quickly in, uh, in uh, the Kane Commission report, which referred to uh, the war game exercise Vigilant Guardian, and I, I think it's footnote 161, it's, it's in my book. Uh, as an over-the-pole Russian exercise uh, to practice for uh, Russian bombers, when in fact uh, the NORAD website indicates that the Russian over-the-pole exercise in progress that day was Northern Vigilance, not Vigilant Guardian, which we now know thanks to USA Today uh, and many other uh, sources and on the record sources submitted to the Commission, was a hijack drill. And we also have statements from Richard Clark in his book that there was another exercise in progress that day called Vigilant Warrior. And I have ob obtained an on-the-record statement from a NORAD officer indicating that that was a live fly exercise. Have you looked into the, uh, the issue of the war game exercises and how important a question do, do you feel that is to answer? Because I also, and I'll shut up with this, you have gone past the point of you have deliberately stopped using the word mistakes that there were a bunch of mistakes that occurred on 9-11, that it was all somehow a bunch of sequential accidents, and you made a deliberate statement about the FBI. Do you, are you beginning to feel that there was some deliberate action uh, that might have affected NORAD's response that day? The only mention of any war game was in a footnote. 
to 9-11 report. Footnote 116 on 9-11, NORAD was scheduled, and, and they lied. They said Vigilant Guardian, Vigilant Guardian was the hijack exercise. It was Northern Vigilance, which was the Soviet drill. So they're trying to confuse you again by lying. I have the original records showing what the drills were. So they lied even in a footnote to the report. Does anybody doubt that Condoleezza Rice was lying when she said we had no idea that anybody would use a plane to crash into the <laughs> uh, We've confirmed a number of lies. We've confirmed numerous lies and inconsistencies in the Keene Commission report. But when the final 9-11 time re report came out, if you look at the right-hand column, all of these times had not been submitted by any agency. That's like the prosecution and the defense submitting exhibits in a court trial, the judge going into chambers and coming out with a whole new set of evidence that neither side had, in, had ever introduced. This was the original submissions to the 9-11 Commission from all the evidence, from all the witnesses who had testified for them about the timing of specific events on September the 11th. What you do need are certain key people in key locations who do know at least most of or a significant part of any secret compartmentalized intelligence, SCI, that, that's an official term, uh, operation. And we, I found several, but this is my favorite of all the ones in 9 11. Dave Frasca, who was head of the Radical Fundamentalist Unit, he stepped on five separate investigations, each one of which could have prevented the attacks. There were two, there was an investigation of two of bin Laden's relatives in early 2001. The White House issued an order which he then put out to the field saying, stop investigating uh, these two brothers of Osama bin Laden who were living in Falls Church, Virginia, right next to CIA headquarters. NORAD press relations officer, Major Don Arias, that according to the terminology, the U.S. government was flying a live fly hijack exercise drill on the morning of September the 11th, which involved planes airliners posing as hijacked aircraft under the direct control of NORAD, the, the Defense Department, and Richard Cheney. You didn't hear, any about, hear anything about that, did you? Um, it's a very telling and it's a very heartrending chapter to read the callousness with which Rudy Giuliani, Dick Cheney, General Ralph Everhart, General Richard Myers, all of the National, Man, National, Command, uh, National Military Command Center staff, and everybody in the PEOC sat there and let the people in the South Tower die because they knew the second plane was coming. And I proved that they, know, that they knew it was coming and that they just let it die. Now, whoever was coordinating the Air Force war games was under the management direction of Dick Cheney, who was also in charge of another terror drill being set up on the west side of New York. It was a bioterror drill called Tripod 2 being set up on Pier 29 on Manhattan's lower west side. And FEMA was already there. And if you read the paper trail that was putting Dick Cheney in charge of all the war game planning back in May, he was coordinating all training, not just in the military, because the FBI, Department of Justice, Health and Human Services, Centers for Disease Control, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, are not military. So all of that was placed under the aegis or under the umbrella of FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Administration. And FEMA was setting up a complete command post on the morning of September the 11th, just by coincidence, another war game. This is a case that I, as a detective, would take to a district attorney tomorrow. I would take crossing the Rubicon, drop it in the lap of a DA, and I say, I want a filing for murder, premeditated, first degree, multiple counts with special circumstances. crossing the Rubicon, you get how these guys work and how they think. I started the first part of the book with detailed emphasis on what? Economics. Money represents the ability to do work, right? Energy is the ability to do work. If I want to take a dollar bill, I can go buy gasoline. That's energy. I can hire someone to clean my house. That's the expenditure of human energy. I can hire someone to cook. I can buy an appliance, which was made with energy and uses energy. You spend dollars to get energy to work for you. If there is no energy, money ultimately becomes valueless, especially the kind of money we have, which is fiat currency. The Fed and the Treasury are doing nothing to discourage consumer debt. 
The U.S. government, Treasury, Federal Reserve doing nothing to stop any of these trends. They're betting on China and most equity has already moved in. All over the world right now, peak oil is hitting. You don't hear about it. We find the stories at FTW. The attacks of September the 11th were the pretext for the American and to a lesser extent the British and the Israeli empires to begin seizing by force. Those energy supplies needed to sustain their power, hegemony, whether regional or global, and their teetering economies. 2003 and 2004, they didn't, there was not a single discovery of a 500 million barrel field. Now to put that in context for you, planet Earth uses a billion barrels of oil every 11 and one half days. That means in 2003 and 2004, they didn't even find one field with a six day supply of oil. It takes three to five years to bring one of those fields online. Three to five years. I mean, you get one well, you got to drill other wells, you got to put in the, the infrastructure, the pumps, the piping. There's all kinds of stuff that has to happen. And oil companies report this. Why? Because their stock goes up when they report discoveries. They have no incentive to hide oil. As a matter of fact, Shell, you know, had to downgrade its reserve estimates four times over the last two years. They were cooking their books. They were inflating their reserve estimates. If I'm a... If I'm BP Amico and I discover a field with 600 million barrels of oil and I announce that all in one year, I have to pay taxes on 600 million barrels of oil all in one year. Do I want to do that? No. So I say I found 100 million barrels this year, 100 million barrels this year, 100 million barrels this year, and that gives the false illusion from an accounting standpoint that more oil is being discovered in old fields. It's pure accounting hodgepodge. It's, it's hocus pocus. There are many different levels of reserves. There's proven reserves, there's estimated reserves, uh, ultimately recoverable reserves, all of which are accounting terms. And we even found that Dale Pfeiffer was digging through a report from the Energy Information Administration about reserves that it says are in the ground. And there was a little footnote. You've got to read the footnote sometimes. It's a pain in the ass, but it really pays off. Because the footnote said the Energy Information Administration adjusts estimated reserves based upon anticipated demand. There will always be oil in the ground, that's good news. Always be oil in the ground, forever. Why? Because an oil field is deemed dry when it takes more oil to get a barrel of oil out of the ground than you get from burning it. The ExxonMobil Corporation, one of the world's largest publicly owned petroleum companies, uh, has quietly joined the ranks of those who are predicting an impending plateau in non-OPEC oil production. Their report, the Outlook for Energy, a, a, a 2030 view, forecasts a peak in just five years. Now, of course, they lie. That's from Alfred J. Corallo from the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. Caught that. Global race is on to snag oil supplies. Now, right after 9-11, that's from the Se Seattle Times, uh, I said, and I said in Crossing the Rubicon, I said in my video, Truth and Lies of 9-11, uh, no, in November of 2001, what we are witnessing at September the 11th, which was the pretext that the U.S. government needed was a war to control the last remaining oil supplies on the planet. Now, where have we deployed since 9-11? Well, gee, we deployed all around here. We've put troops up here in Georgia. We've occupied Iraq. We've put Turkey's part in NATO. We're heavily involved in Israel. Yeah, we've got troops now in Yemen and Djibouti. The British control Oman. Oman. We have surrounded 60% of all the oil on the planet. It's consistent with the motive, is it not? And that 60% is going to become very important when you understand that oil discoveries have been in progressive decline since 1962. In order to pump oil, you have to find it first. Does that make sense? Okay. Global oil discoveries peaked in 1962. Steady downslope. Now planet Earth uses three plus, you know, 3.3 something, almost four barrels of oil for every barrel that it finds. And the gap is getting wider every year. Peak oil production has already hit every nation in the world except Iran, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia. But Saudi Arabia, we know now, and I should redo this, I think Saudi Arabia has peaked, and there's very compelling evidence that it has. We will talk about that. The single largest oil field in the world is Gawar, G-H-A-W-A-R, in Saudi Arabia. 
which when discovered was estimated to hold about 90 billion barrels. Major stories everywhere that Gawar has peaked. As a matter of fact, three major papers have published stories showing that Gawar has peaked. Gawar has peaked, Saudi Arabia has peaked. Saudi Arabia contains 25% of the known oil reserves on the planet. 25%. If Saudi Arabia has peaked, planet Earth has peaked. Axiomatic, it's simple mathematics. Chevron Texaco, the CEO just wrote a check because their profits are up and, and, and they've been holding their profits for 16.4 billion to buy Unical. That's because the Chinese offered 13 billion in cash to buy the company last December. But that's because Chevron knows there's no place else to get oil. So, what, so how are oil, oil companies adding to reserves? They're just buying other companies' reserves. They aren't discovering anymore. Let's go back to May 2001, critical month, when the NEP, NEPDP report was released. America in the year 2001 faces the most serious energy shortage since the oil embargoes of the 1970s. Estimates indicate that over the next 20 years, U.S. oil consumption will increase by 33%, natural gas by well over 50%, and demand for electricity by 45%. U.S. energy consumption is expected to increase by 30, about 32 percent by 2020. Between 2000 and 2020, U.S. natural gas demand is projected by the Energy Information Administration to increase by more than 50 percent. Yet we produce 39 percent less oil today than we did in 1970. 1970 was the year that the United States oil production peaked. We have been in irreversible decline since 1970 within the United States. As you pass peak, every barrel of oil that you pump becomes more expensive and harder to get out of the ground, and it's inferior quality. The planet Earth is plus or minus one year at the all-time peak of hydrocarbon energy production. Simply put, we have used half of all the oil God placed on this planet, and every drop, every barrel extracted from the ground from now on will become progressively more expensive Quality and on our present course, America, 20 years from now, will import nearly two of every three barrels of oil, a condition of increased dependency on foreign powers that do not always have America's best interests at heart. As if somehow it was an obligation for every other country in the world to have our best interests at heart. I'm not so sure I agree with that. How many people here believe that economic growth is possible unto infinity? Good, no hands there. All right. Well, we know that economic growth is connected to energy usage. How many people believe that energy is infinite? Energy converts in one direction only, from usable to unusable. It's the law of entropy. It never converts backwards. There is no free lunch. There is no perpetual motion. And I predicted the New England blackout by watching uh, uh, gas stocks and knowing that, that, that no infrastructure was being built to generate more electricity in New England. Six weeks before it happened, I called it. Remember the big blackouts we had in Italy and France, right? Huge blackouts because the infrastructure isn't being rebuilt, energy shortages. Well, this one just hit in Moscow a week ago. This is BBC News. It was, maybe, it was less than a week ago, I think. I have the date. But it shut down the whole city of Moscow. Their stock exchange. Did you hear about that, by the way? No, shut down, and the problem was no infrastructure was being built. Who's going to get hurt more by peak oil? The places where the lights are brightest. Would you rather fall from the penthouse to the sidewalk or from the sidewalk to the gutter? <laughs> the world is getting ready for global war. We have major economic alerts coming about major crashes all over the planet, blackouts, people starving this winter, people, uh, people freezing to death this winter, major global conflict. Don't you think it was time if somebody knew where all this secret oil was, it's time to produce it? This is the world population. From the time of Christ on Illumini, this little plague the dip here is the bubonic plague. This is the beginning of uh, steam, coal, and that's oil. All of that population exists only because of oil and hydrocarbon energy. There are no replacements that will replace at the same level of consumption. 
Uh, China is experiencing blackouts and threatening to shut down businesses that consume too much energy. South Africa is predicting permanent blackouts by 2010. Again, I have the sources for all of this. Australia and New Zealand are currently experiencing energy shortages and blackouts. Very serious in New Zealand and some parts of Australia. Thailand is experiencing blackouts. The UK is experiencing severe energy shortages. The EU has decided to lift its ban on arms sales to China. There was some debate, but it looks like that they're going to start selling to China. Texaco's CEO has announced that world oil supply cannot meet demand. Russia has shifted to a basket of currencies emphasizing the euro. Venezuela is buying MiG-29s and Russian missile, missiles, forming a defense pact with Brazil and preparing for a proxy war with Colombia. We'll talk about that. Syria and Iran are receiving Russia and Chinese military assistance. The housing bubble is starting to collapse as legislation to seize and shut down Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac is introduced in the Senate. And we could have a nuclear war tomorrow if we invade Iran or Venezuela and Colombia could go, or, uh, you know, Iraq could go, Saudi Arabia could go. Malaysia and Indonesia have actually been close to fighting over oil uh, recently. So any one of these things could trigger nuclear conflict. It's not just about how we survive running out of oil, it's, it's how we keep the lunatics from blowing up the whole planet before we try to address that question. We got that recurring problem about the fact that the planet's falling apart. You know? And boy, you want to see something get pissed off. This planet, Mother Earth, could just shrug her shoulders and we'd be gone in a heartbeat. This is Africa. Although much smaller than the reserves of the Middle East, these African reserves are critical to swing and less, uh, lesser suppliers of oil in a world where, as we too well know now, the removal of just a million barrels a day from global supply can wreak economic havoc. Africa, that's Africa, just in the last year. And this again is changing every day. West Africa is critical because Nigeria is the fifth largest oil exporter, Angola is ninth in the world. There's lots of undeveloped oil in here, not hundreds of billions of barrels. West Africa has recoverable oil, but it takes six weeks to get a drop of oil from the Persian Gulf, where 60% of the known reserves are, and that's what's going on there. Six weeks to get a drop into your gas tank. It takes two weeks to get a drop from here into your gas tank. So not only do we have problems with supply, there's no elasticity. In order to keep up appearances, they have to keep the supplies flowing to keep the financial markets from crashing. The world's getting ready to go to war all over West Africa. Recent guerrilla conflict or civil unrest? Here. Recent coup or coup attempt? Here, and Sao Tome and Francique, you can't even see, it happened there. Some very scary things is what looks to me like, and I strongly su suspect, are outbreaks of man-made, bioengineered biological weapons. Equatorial Guinea, they had a coup attempt. That should be shaded because Sir Mark Thatcher, the son of yeah. Lady Margaret Thatcher, just pled guilty last week to attempting to overthrow the government in Equatorial Guinea. U.S. military is building strong permanent bases in this region here right now. Oil exploration here, here, here. Sudan, China, China gets 15% of its imports from the Sudan. Nigeria, again, looks to be the boiling point. That's an original OPEC member. Angola is the ninth largest uh, supplier uh, of American oil. Nigeria is, I think, number six uh, supplier of the U.S. Uh, they just opened a pipeline from Chad, Cameroon. The French were just flying uh, Mirage fighter jets to Queller Revolt in Cote d'Ivoire or the Ivory Coast. Of course, remember the U.S. military just went to Liberia not too long ago. Uh, Morocco tied to the Spanish bombing, oil exploration. Kermagee and Halliburton are going heavy here. Mohammed al Khatami is on, currently, right now, on a seven-nation Africa tour doing deals with all of these nations. Who's the other OPEC nation that has already called America to go stick it up its, you know what? <laughs> Venezuela. There is something incredibly powerful about Hugo Chavez. I, I clipped a headline that I used in about 10 of my lectures in four countries. It was, a, it was an Associated Press story. The headline was, Chavez calls Bush asshole. And it was just so amazing. Right after Chavez called Bush an asshole, and that was the headline, he said, if the United States tries this one more time, I'm going to shut off all the oil to the U.S. <laughs> Two weeks later, a top-level delegation from China was in Caracas, Venezuela. And just 10 days ago, the Chinese announced the deal that they're going to buy 40% of Venezuela's oil. 
Do you hear the drums of war beating anywhere around here? Because Venezuela owns the Citgo gas stations, right? Fourth largest supplier to the U.S. It only takes two days to get oil from Venezuela into your gas tank. Now, you know that the U.S., is, uh, especially the Bush administration, is not particularly fond of President Hugo Chavez of Venezuela. Yes. We sponsored a couple of coups, and he beat them both, you know. Chavez is, in his sleep, is 100 times smarter than George Bush. And he is becoming a true charismatic Bolivarian leader who was uniting almost all of Latin America behind him right now. He and President Lula of Brazil are forming very strong economic alliances, and together they're offering deals to Argentina and Chile and Bolivia and Peru, and they're all starting to come together realizing that they really can stand separate from the U.S. And South America has been really a Rockefeller proprietary corporation for most of its uh, existence. Venezuela is jittery with fear of counter-revolution. Now, what's amazing is the people of Venezuela, and not like the United States, where there's no major rush to enlist in the U.S. Army, in case you hadn't noticed, the people of Venezuela are flocking to join militias to defend Venezuela in the event of a U.S. attack or coup. South America is uniting rapidly. Energy alliances are forming. Chavez is doing great things with Brazil, Brazil with Chile. I mean, they're all really getting their shit together. Uh, but there's one problem, is that there's a major Spanish-speaking country called Mexico. Because Mexico is being folded into NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. It's already part of NORTHCOM, having surrendered its military uh, control to a four-star American general. Uh, Mexico is going to be extremely schizophrenic, and God forbid, God help Mexico. Mexico is going to be really torn asunder as it decides whether it's a gringo uh, colony or a Latin American nation. So Mexico is going to have an enormous identity crisis as the world unfolds. Britain is dependent upon Russia for its energy. Ultimately, it will be the end of the Russian natural gas pipeline. And poor old Ireland, way out there, is the end of that food chain. Russia may stop exporting energy sources by 2010. They're going over peak now. They've, there are actually two peaks. One, when we first co collapsed their economy at the end of the Cold War, which destroyed their infrastructure and their, their ability to produce oil. And now Vladimir Putin is pumping oil hand over fist, getting all the cash he can, building up Putin's 100 times smarter than Bush. Japan needs Russian oil and China needs Russian oil. Russia the oil is up here in Siberia, and this was part of the jailing of Mikhail Khorokovsky, the major Russian oligarch who was just sentenced to nine years in prison. He wanted to let the U.S. in. He also wanted to send oil uh, out here to Japan uh, because the Japanese wanted a pipeline that would terminate out here near Sakhalin Island so that they could get Russian oil. The Chinese wanted a pipeline. And in January, surprising everybody, the Russians said, okay, the Japanese win, they're going to get the pipeline. The caveat was that the Japanese had to finance the pipeline. This is far from over, and China is far from out of the game. I would not put it past Putin to use it to buy time with the U.S. Japan is our buddy, while laying the seeds for a collapse of talks and construction down the road. Russia cannot afford to lose access to Ukraine because it's, because it's right on the Black Sea, and it will shut Russia off from access to the Black Sea and also from several ports. But more importantly, it will lock Russia out of Europe. It will make Russia an Asian nation. So now we've got all these flashpoints that could lead to war. China and Russia will hold their first ever joint military exercises. Does that scare you? A whole new alliance is forming against the United States. One of, its, uh, one of the names that has been given is called the BRIC Alliance, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. China, Russia, Iran, Venezuela, India, Brazil, Malaysia, South Africa, Europe, parts of West Africa are forging economic alliances which exclude the U.S. The whole world is turning on us. China is already consuming or hoarding 60% of the world's commodities. Oil, cement, aluminum, copper, zinc, manganese, steel, coal, gold, silver, etc. Chinese state-owned oil firm Sinotec confirms interest in Alberta oil sands. And Chinese want to buy Canadian oil. China and Canada have just signed an oil energy pact. China and Canada? Yeah, you know, I always knew it was the damn Canadian's fault, didn't you? <laughs> Why is China buying equity stakes in Alberta oil companies? Because they know there's no place else to get the oil. Okay, so the Chinese are now, they just did this $10 billion investment with Brazil and a $20 billion investment with Argentina. 
1998, China passed the Exclusive Economic Zone and Continental Shelf Act, which means that China claimed all mineral rights out to the Asian continental shelf. China is not also consuming most of the world's commodities. It's stockpiling and hoarding them. In 2004, they bought or consumed half of the world's cement, interfering with building projects in the US. Did you know that? You did, good. In 2004, China purchased twice as much copper as the rest of the world combined. In 2004, China purchased almost one third of the world's coal and is currently experiencing coal shortages. In 2004, China purchased 90% of the world's steel output. U.S. intelligence, the CIA report forecast India and China will be major powers in 2020. Now here comes the CIA and my response to this is, duh. Those commodities that I described, cement, steel, what do they have in common? They're heavy, right? All right, would you rather, if you were China, ship those commodities to China when fuel costs are five times higher they are now and you gotta pay five times as much to fill up your local freight shipping container cargo vessel? Or would you buy them now when, when, when fuel costs wouldn't make it prohibited and hoard, hoard them? China's very well aware of peak oil. They're planning for it. China's already having blackouts. They're on a panicked global search for energy. They'll go wherever they have to to get it. China is now the second largest energy importer on the planet after the United States. Its economy is growing at 8, 9, 10 percent a year. UK expects Brussels to lift China's China arms ban. The, U, the EU may turn on us and lift the ban on weapon sales to China. Is China the end game? We wrote about this three years ago. Now, U.S. significantly raises China's oil demand outlook. This and one other study I read. Now, everybody understands exponential growth, like compound interest, right? It's dangerous. China's current economic growth rate is between 7 and 8 percent, okay? which means that the 7 percent it grows next year is on top of the 7 percent this year, and, it, and the growth curve goes like this. By the year 2035, if China's growth rate doesn't change, there will be 700 million internal combustion-powered vehicles in China. Now, how do you think that's going to be for the ozone layer? China's raising, rising grain prices could signal global food crisis. China's facing all kinds of economic collapse, too much for Mother Earth, and we're looking at some of the real stuff with climate change. They have no environmental protection in China. The uh, air pollution is horrible. Uh, the water is uh, incredibly polluted. Uh, China is caught in its own uh, no-win situation. Seattle Post Intelligence, or the Associated Press, China faces, is also facing severe water shortages, as is the whole planet. Water is a whole separate issue right now. Water is, is almost as critical as oil right now. Too much for Mother Earth, and this is talking about China's consumption of commodities and energies and goods and everything. It's actually overwhelming the planet. We wrote two years ago, China was the end game. 2002 September, again almost three years ago, I said China was the end game, and guess what, it's the end game. But everything in this regency, region will fall under Chinese hegemony. This is a great story from the current issue of the Atlantic Monthly, How We Would Fight China, which lays out the battle plan of the end game. All of China's oil passes right through here, the Straits of Malacca, which at its narrowest point is only about, I think, 1.4, maybe 2 miles wide. 40% of all the world's piracy occurs right there. Okay. So China gets all its oil through there. Japan gets all its oil through there. Chinese economic growth is also like a house of cards. They've got fraudulent bank loans. They've overextended. They, you know, they've got bad loans. They're running a bubble to grow the Chinese economy as fast as possible because they're hoarding the commodities. But they're also trapped in this economic paradigm. And China is not this huge powerhouse that you might all think it is. China's got horrible internal problems, both economically and politically and culturally and ecologically. The Sony and the GM factories and the, uh, the Toyota factories all operating in China, they're having blackouts because China doesn't have enough energy to generate electricity and they're shutting down the plants sometimes two, three days a week because they got no energy. Now, as you talk about the interdependence of the world economy, Wall Street depends upon what goes on in China. Why? Because they buy our goods. China is the end game because it's, it's, it, this is a game of musical chairs. But now we weed out countries. If these are the major players, boom, well, there's a Thailand. I guess they don't need oil. And boom, oh, there's a, okay, there's a, we can live without New Zealand. Okay, we'll, we'll, the last two will be China and the U.S. Last 
spring, just after the U.S. occupation of Iraq, it was disclosed that the Israeli government had entered negotiations with U.S. representatives to explore the possibility of rebuilding a demolished pipeline from northern Iraq to the Israeli port of Haifa. We all know that Iraqi oil production has not soared since we occupied or liberated the country, right? Iraqi oil production peaked in 1990 at 3.5 million barrels a day. It's never been over 2.3 million barrels a day since. Uh, they have pipelines over there that have been blown up so many times that they've been nicknamed the flute, um, <laughs> which they barred from the Colombians. Uh, oh, and here's something really scary, and this is just a sidebar, but I read this and I just went, oh my God. Uh, I, I clipped a little story that said Halliburton, you know, Kellogg, Brown and Root that runs all of, you know, a lot of the mercenaries and everything else. They've just hired a couple of hundred Colombian paramilitaries who've been fighting the FARC rebels to go over to Iraq. And I can see Dick Cheney saying, oh, these Iraqi guys think they're bad? Wait till my Colombian guys get over there. I've always said for years now that the U.S. intends to carve up Iraq into five or six states. Why? Because if you want to control the oil, you only have to control a tiny sliver of land in Iraq. The intent of the United States government is to balkanize Iraq. Why? Because all the oil is in a very thin sliver. Why do you want to police and control the whole country and expend the resources for that when you can carve it up into six states and just control the states where the oil is? Uh, Ayatollah alarms Sunnis with pledge of security force purge, and this talks more about the setup for the civil war that's coming. Most of the aid for the Sunni uh, rebels in Iraq is coming, of course, from Iran. That's no big secret. I have sources in Iran who've told me that. I've met them at international conferences, at uh, oil conferences. That's no big secret. But we, we, we clearly seem to be letting the Sunnis have their way, and that's because we clearly intend to start the civil war and balkanize the country. You know, the peak of Iraqi oil production was three and a half million barrels a day. We barely topped 2 million barrels a day one since, and it's now about 1.8 million barrels a day, so because the infrastructure is getting blown up. Iraq has become the absolute hell on earth, uh, what we have done to that country. When King Fahd dies, you watch what happens to Saudi Arabia. As much as I know that the U.S. intends to balkanize Iraq, we also intend to balkanize Saudi Arabia. As I showed in Crossing the Rubicon, if you've read Crossing the Rubicon, you see that map where I show that 60% of all the world's recoverable oil is in a little triangle, and almost all the recoverable oil in Saudi Arabia is in a little sliver in the eastern third of the country. Why do we want to control the whole country of Saudi Arabia? Out in the west is Mecca and Medina. We don't want to get involved with those nasty Muslim radicals. We'll just break up the country. Well, there's one thing we have to wait for, and I said it right here. Saudi's King Fahd. Saudi Arabia, being the largest oil producer and the, the real powerhouse of OPEC, has several times over the course of the last year, don't worry, America, we will come to save you. We'll print, we'll pump all this extra oil. We've actually upped our production by 50,000 barrels, 100,000 barrels, 500,000 barrels a day. World's using 83, 84 million barrels a day. What the Saudis didn't tell you was that the only oil they increased production of was called heavy sour oil. How many people think that the government of Saudi Arabia would absolutely never tell a lie about oil reserves? Saudi Arabia is now begging, asking for $623 billion in foreign investment. First of all, how many people think that Saudi Arabia doesn't have $623 billion of their own? They're asking for us to invest in Saudi Arabia so that they can fulfill their public relations pledge to go out and pour all this money into oil production to produce oil they know they don't have. Japan, China, 
Malaysia, Indonesia, India, Brazil, Western Europe cannot survive without Iranian oil. There's no place to get it. India just signed a $40 billion deal with Iran for oil and natural gas. Europe is signing deals with Iran hand over fist. The president of Iran, Mohammed al Khatami, is on currently a seven nation African tour. And one story that just broke yesterday said Iran is about to close a major deal with Nigeria. Now, what do Iran and Nigeria have in common? OPEC members. Now, how many people think the U.S. is going to invade Iran? Iran. No. How many people think the U.S. might, might change, uh, stage airstrikes with the Israeli government against Iranian nuclear facilities? That's possible. The U.S. will never, can't invade Iran. And if the U.S. does, um, I, let me just tell you this in advance so you won't have to read my website. If you wake up one morning and you see that the United States has launched the military of invasion Iran, pack up your belongings, head for the woods, write your will, bend over and kiss your ass goodbye. The world, by the way, has drawn a line around Iran. But what the world is saying is, wait a minute, Japan gets a lot of its oil from Iran. China gets some of its oil from Iran. All these countries, and we, those countries, will not allow the United States to invade Iran because what's going to happen if we invade Iran? Like Iraq. The same thing that happened in Iraq. And Iran is ten times the military foe. The Chinese just signed a $200 billion deal with Iran. $200 billion. $140 for oil, $60 billion for natural gas. Russia is pouring money into Iran. The world has drawn a line around, a line in the sand around Iran. The world will not let the United States invade Iran. But the neocons, the insane maniacs that they are, may actually believe that they have to push that button. We're probably going to nuke each other or, or unleash bi uh, biological weapons. Can you picture Henry Kissinger sitting back and saying, "Well." The problem is not that there is too little oil. The problem is just that there are too many people. So we're going to war all over the planet, and of course we're preparing for that. America's foes prepare for monetary jihad. Yeah, that includes George Bush, Jack Snow, the Secretary of the Treasury, Dick Cheney, the Chairman of the Federal Reserve in New York, and the, and the Chairman of Greenspan, and the Chair of the New York Fed. They're all planning a major war on you, on your dollars. Central banks can't count the cost of weak dollars. My whole thesis is that until you change the way money works, you change nothing. Period. If you take a dollar bill out of your wallet, or a 20, or a 100, or whatever, and you look at it, what does it represent? Money represents the ability to do work. Our economic paradigm is based upon infinite growth or if you're looking on the, the uh, graph this way, infinite growth. For the past 50 years, there's been a 96% correlation between economic growth, GDP growth, whatever you want to call it, and greenhouse gas emission. You cannot have economic growth without burning more energy. It's simple if you think about it. If Joe Blow wants to open a pizza parlor or a nail salon or whatever, you got to build. So you got to have the trucks drive in, you got to hook up the power, people got to drive their cars, you got to burn electricity. You got to burn energy to get there and use it. Economic growth not possible without energy. So now the need for infinite economic growth set by the economic paradigm is colliding with finite energy. Something's got to give. I didn't come up with this great notion. Matthew Simmons, the world's largest energy investment banker. Clients include the World Bank, Kerr McGee, Halliburton. The world economy, the world economic paradigm is based upon fiat currency, basically the United States dollar, but most other currencies are fiat currency. Fractional reserve banking, where a bank can lend between nine and fifteen dollars depending upon their reserve requirements, based upon how many dollars they have on deposit and debt-based growth. You borrow money to grow. That economic paradigm requires infinite growth. Every year, the companies that trade their stock on Wall Street have to report growth or their stocks collapse and the CEOs get fired. Are you aware that GM and Ford bonds have been cut to junk status? The GM's on the brink of bankruptcy? 
Yeah, well, before you clap, think about the price. If GM, you know, branding has a huge value. The brand name Coca-Cola has enormous value, doesn't it? Whether you like Coke or not. The brand name Nike has enormous value, doesn't it? Whether you, the brand name United States has enormous value. Do you remember the saying from the 1950s and 60s, what's good for GM is good for America? If GM goes foreign confidence in this country, we need $2 billion a day in foreign investment to keep this economy from imploding right now. If GM goes bankrupt, you think that, okay, so be careful what you pray for. You just might get it. The Fed and the Treasury are doing nothing to discourage consumer debt. The U.S. government, Treasury, Federal Reserve doing nothing to stop any of these trends. They're betting on China and most equity has already moved in. And the first thing everybody says is, why would George Bush and Dick Cheney want to wreck the U.S. economy? <laughs> Let me ask a rhetorical question. How many people believe that the Great Depression really hurt the Rockefellers? <laughs> How many people believe that the Great Depression really took wealth away from the richest 1%, the Morgans, the DuPonts? It's exactly right, because the Great Depression was a wealth transfer. It was not a depression, it was a transfer. The economy's getting ready to collapse, big time, and that's the whole picture for the United States. The trade deficit represents debts and bonds that are like $900 billion, and the stock value is only worth $100 million. That's why the collapse is inevitable. Capitalism requires people to be quiet souls in the workplace and wild pagans at the cash register. It's the way money works, it's an economic system, and it's an elite above the White House that is driving this careening car and taking this planet off a cliff. We are buying everything overseas and we're not making anything here and we're getting all of our stuff made there and it's all money flowing out and then we borrow the money and we ship it back out and you guys are in the middle as literally the conduit for this cycle because you're encouraged to borrow and to spend beyond your means and not save so that you can keep this bubble afloat. And there, the, the United States government is literally about to tank and destroy the dollar. All the big, rich money, the money that the Bushes and the Cheneys and the Rockefellers has already moved offshore. It will not be hurt by a collapse in the United States. As a matter of fact, they will make money and they will achieve several objectives by crashing the U.S. economy, and you'll see that. The U.S. dollar is the largest reserve currency in the world. It's the way we get all this cheap oil, because we make everybody buy oil in dollars. That's the way oil has been priced. You should know that Saddam Hussein decided to price his oil in euros uh, in, uh, what was it, 2000? Or 1999. And that is probably one of the major reasons why we had to go kick his butt out of there. Foreign central banks are dumping U.S. dollar assets, and that is really significant. It's, it's been the, the dollar has been the reserve currency for the entire planet for, again, 50 years plus. Oil's been priced in dollars, although people are starting to price it in euros. And you know what Iran's biggest crime is? They're opening an oil bourse, trading in oil futures priced in euros. This year, Iran is going to open an oil futures bourse. That's like a little stock market trading oil in euros. World is on the brink of ruin. Now I'm talking about your pocketbook and the American economy. Fears for dollars as central banks sell U.S. assets. Central banks around the world have started to dump treasury bills in U.S. dollars. The dollar is going to crash very soon. It actually has been crashing. Now again, the dollar's price has recently risen against the euro, but as you research that, you find that it's not foreign governments buying, it's these banks in the Caribbean, which are using the money, our looted money, that's been moved offshore to buy the treasury bills to keep the economy from collapsing right now. I'm convinced the U.S. economy will start to go, or go completely, in the third or fourth quarter of this year. The dollar is going in value. But the euro is going, and the Europeans don't like that because nobody's buying European products. But I think Europe can withstand that, and I think Europe will withstand that. But the central banks holding dollars are declaring losses. Yeah, but now it's been documented that quietly over the past two years, uh, Ch China and India have dumped 13% of their dollar holdings. And it's like a run on the bank. They can't dump them all at once because, you know, the value will tank. They want to sell while they're high and, you know, factor their way out of it. So it's like a game before everything collapses, but it's coming. You can't sell any more gadgets and doodads and deep, but China, on the other hand, and India are huge markets that want all the shit that you got.
which is dependent upon oil and energy to produce, to run, to manufacture. So this crash is being planned. It's coming the third or fourth quarter of this year. The European Central Bank, you can barely see the headline. And this just came out like two or three days ago. European Central Bank to report 2004 budget loss due to dollar drop. All these countries that are holding dollars now are losing money. T Thailand is starting to bail out of the dollar. Uh, wobbly dollar spells trouble for central bankers. That's in Australia. China has just authorized four of its bank to start selling dollar assets. Mexico has started dumping dollars a little, a little bit. EU to begin trade talks with Iran. Whoa, Europe's going to Iran. Just now in the middle of the falling dollar crisis. And you're a the drug dealer who no longer accept the dollar. Oh, I know that. Watch my next slide. Even drug dealers are giving up on the dollar. How many have followed my work for more than two years? How did I get my start in this? CIA and drugs, $600 billion a year in drug money flowing through Wall Street. If the dollar gets weak, they aren't going to put their dollars in Wall Street, are they? Because they aren't going to have dollars. Wall Street only trades in dollars. I really got my start on this with CIA and drugs showing how $600 billion a year in drug money is laundered through the U.S. financial markets. All the drug dealers of the world have now dumped the dollar and they're using euros. The dollar's shrinking in value. Now, I've seen this myself, that you know, in, in, in the days of the major cartels, they didn't count money, they weighed it. They would make pallets of money that would be one ton of $100 bills and they would know plus or minus a thousand bucks how much it was. Well, now, as the euro gets to 130, 134, it's been as high as 136 to the dollar, and it'll go back up there pretty soon. So if you're smuggling currency, it obviously makes more sense to, to smuggle euros than dollars, especially since they now have a 200-euro note. If the drug dealers are playing the dollar, you better believe that the, the dollar's game is over because the drug dealers are the, some of the smartest money men I've ever met in my life. And here it says, right here, it says euro trash. Drug dealers are... Don't give me no more dollars. We don't want your speaking dollars. Okay. We have seen people like Stephen Roach, uh, Morgan Stanley, uh, a Wall Street guru, say an economic Armageddon is imminent. How many people have credit cards? You may not trust them. You may think that they're rich capitalist, swine dog, elitist, whatever you want to call them, but they're talking about their own money here. And when these guys talk, people listen because the fundamentals are all clearly in place. And the problems are several fold behind the economic crash that is coming that will be nothing like we have ever seen before. Start exploring, exploring precious metals, clearly. The only investment personally I will make is in physical gold. That's it, gold that I own and I hold, maybe some silver. I'm gonna talk about gold, I'm a fan of gold, a great fan of gold, physical gold. There's five times more paper gold out there than there is gold out of the ground. The price of gold, enormously well documented by a group called GATA, the Gold Antitrust Action Committee, has been maliciously suppressed by the central banks who flood the gold market to keep the gold price down. Because if you are an economist, economists traditionally believe that as long as the price of gold stays down, there's an economic hope. So you should still keep putting your money into the markets. They've been bombing the price of gold lately, but gold has still risen something like 25% in the last three years. So those of you who have been following FTW and you, and, and you bought gold, hold on to it because gold's going to break out very quickly. How many people really get that there is such a thing as a housing bubble in this country? We're going to talk about the housing bubble. How many people own homes? How many people here believe that that's your savings? How many people have mortgages? Way too many hands. How many people own your homes outright? Uh, okay, let me flip the question. How many people have one mortgage? How many people have two mortgages? How many people have more than two mortgages? <laughs> How many people have lots of equity in your home, even though you're not paid off? All right. How many people uh, have paid off less than 10 or 20 percent of the principal of your home? You wouldn't dare raise your hands anyway. <laughs> how, many, how many people bought second homes on credit? How many people have refinanced their homes to buy consumer goods, vacations? The housing bubble is a global bubble. LA Times just, a, just four days ago, it's not a bubble till it bursts.
housing values, you can expect them to drop 50% over a two-year period. And people are being encouraged to borrow to spend what sustains the economy. They are lending money to people who haven't got jobs to buy houses to keep the bubble going. Zero down, zero interest to buy a second home when, when people are sometimes mortgaged 110% on their first home. Does that make sense to you? You know, people are getting surprised all over the world because their credit card rates, there's a little contract that says the credit card company can adjust the rates. And we were seeing people's minimum payments go from $200 a month to $450 a month just because the interest rate went from 5% to 18 or 24%. That's part of the falling dollar. America is oversaturated. I mean, if I can sound like George Carlin for a minute, he did a great routine using the word shit, okay? You people can't buy any more shit because you got so much shit, you got no place to put your shit, and shit, you, you're so up mortgaged up with, with your credit cards that you can't, you know, you, are, are you getting the picture? This country is totally in debt. U.S. current account deficit may hit 900 billion next year. That's the trade deficit. We are buying everything overseas, and we're not making anything here, and we're getting all of our stuff made there, and it's all money flowing out, and then we borrow the money, and we ship it back out, and you guys are in the middle as literally the conduit for this cycle, because you're encouraged to borrow and to spend beyond your means and not save so that you can keep this bubble of wealth. And the United States government is literally about to tank and destroy the dollar. So they stockpile and they run up their dollars, they run their economy, burn more oil, they get more dollars to buy more oil. To, to simplify this, I would say that a snake eating its own tail is not nutritious. Right now, if I were to tell you the one thing that I thought you needed to do is get out of debt immediately. Get out of debt, because when the economy crashes, you don't know how hard you're going to be hit, and you could wind up being indentured servants under the, the new bankruptcy law, which just passed last month. When these chickens come home to roost, the people who are in debt, and you know, there's stuff coming with civil liberties. We may have a debtor's prison here soon. Uh, the bankruptcy laws have changed. You want my advice on how to survive the first parts of peak oil? Get out of debt because they're going to make you a slave and you will have no options to move anywhere, do anything, go any place, change any part of your lifestyle except for become indentured wage peon servants for the corporations for pennies of slave wage money to pay off debts because you can no longer get out from under, underneath them due to the new bankruptcy law which just passed two months ago. Are you aware about that? and the corporations will determine how much you can write off, how much money you're entitled to live on, where you can move, and where you can work. Your creditors will determine what's discharged, where you work, and how much money you get to live on if you go bankrupt. Indentured servitude. And yet, what do they put out to you every day? Buy, consume, breed, buy, consume, breed, more, buy, buy, credit, easy, buy, get, go, taste, spend, more. Get out of debt. I'm telling you, get out of debt. Uh, I have seen a completely new term creep into the lexicon uh, around peak oil. And it just came out of the blue. It's called demand destruction. How do you destroy demand for oil? No. You collapse the economy. People who are out of work, unemployed, and starving don't drive cars. They don't take vacations. They don't borrow money. They don't buy second cars. They don't fly on airplanes demand destruction. And this term is coming out of the Council on Foreign Relations, it's coming out of the you know, trilaterals, it's coming out of some of the big powerhouses up here, because one of the ways to mitigate the effects of peak oil is to destroy demand. There are 10 calories of hydrocarbon energy in every calorie of food consumed on the planet, on average. Why? You gotta plow the field. How do you plow the field? You drive an oil power machine to plow the field, don't you? Then you gotta plant the seed. You gotta drive an oil power machine to come back along and plant the seed. Then you gotta irrigate the crops. How do you irrigate the fields? You pump the water. How do you pump the water? Electricity. How is the electricity made? Oil, natural gas, coal. Then you gotta spray it with pesticides. What are the pesticides made of? Oil. Then you gotta fertilize it with nitrogen-based fertilizers. Where does that come from? Natural gas. Then you gotta harvest it. 
How do you harvest it? Oil powered machine. Then you got to drive it to a food processing plant, oil powered machine. Then they run on electricity and more chemicals at the food processing plant, and then they wrap it in plastic, which is oil again, and drive it by an oil powered machine to your supermarket where you drive an oil powered machine. You pull a piece of plastic out of your wallet, which is also oil, <coughs> and you take it home and throw it in a microwave oven and burn electricity generated by oil, and then you put it on a plate and eat it. And the 10 calories doesn't count the cooking energy involved. That is why permaculture, that is why organic farming, not using any kind of petroleum-based or, or uh, uh, hydrocarbon-based energy or chemicals is the only solution for mankind. I live in Los Angeles. Southern California has the best strawberry fields in the world, yet I can go to a supermarket and the strawberries come from Chile. 10,000 mile Caesar salads. Uh, they mine tin and aluminum in Australia and send it to uh, Norway to make, uh, to uh, uh, Holland to make tin cans, send it to Norway to fill it with sardines and send it back to Britain where it gets wrapped so they can come back and sell the same sardines back in American supermarkets. Globalization is dead with peak oil. D-E-D, -E -D, dead. I'm convinced Richard Duncan, Richard Heinberg, all the great thinkers on peak oil have looked at it. A population of six and a half billion, let alone nine billion, where we're going to be by the middle of the century, is not sustainable in a post-petroleum environment or an environment of declining oil, unless, unless or until there is a massive shift, shift to permaculture and organic farming, and the corporations ain't going to allow that. With peak oil, you're going to see the U.S. going to nuclear and coal. What choice do we have? Wind, geothermal, hydrogen is an absolute joke. Don't even look. You know, it takes 1,113 gallons of gaseous hydrogen to equal the energy in one gallon of gasoline. These hydrogen companies threatened to sue us. And they said, well, we've proven that you can get a, a range of 300 miles on a tank of compressed hydrogen. I said, great, who's going to do the crash tests? Now, hydrogen is an absolute chimera. It's a joke. There will be no solution from hydrogen anywhere under any circumstances. Uh, EV Magazine just uh, about six months ago published a story saying fuel cell engines, hydrogen fuel cell engines, have a life expectancy of 200 hours. Now, would you buy a hydrogen fuel cell car if you knew that every 200 hours of use you had to buy a new engine for it? Right now on this planet there are between 750 and 800 million internal combustion powered vehicles. Each one of those vehicles, according to a couple studies we found, takes on the average between 12 and 15 percent of all the oil it will ever use in its lifetime just to make. Why? You gotta mine the ore. How do you do that? With an oil-powered machine. You gotta get it to a smelter. Then you gotta cook it till it melts. All that's hydrocarbon energy. You gotta move it down a production line. You gotta form it. You gotta shape it. You gotta paint it. That's oil. 12 percent. There are seven gallons of oil in every tire. So let's assume tomorrow that we had a whole new source of energy, cold fusion, which would solve all the world's problems. It wouldn't solve the fertilizer problem. It wouldn't solve the pesticide problem or the plastic problem. Climate, more good news. My job, increase in dead zones in the world's oceans. Global warming and climate change is that the neocons and the oil companies have decided it'll be much easier to drill for oil if we melt the polar ice caps. The oil companies are saying, hey, let's melt the North Pole because we can get a little more oil and we can actually move ships through the Northwest Passage to ship Russian oil over to Japan if we need to because it's a shorter route, the polar route. How many people were aware that the Pentagon leaked a report about a year, year and a half ago showing that they were afraid that the Gulf Stream was going to collapse and plunge Europe into an ice age because we're melting too much of the ice caps? Well, guess what? It's already starting to happen. The cold water's coming off the pole, and it was, of course, the cold water will drive the warm water of the Gulf Stream underneath it, which would plunge Britain, it could uh, plunge Europe, excuse me, into an ice age. The world seas are dying. The Sunday Times Britain. Britain faces big chill as ocean current slows. Look at the date. This is from May. The Gulf Stream is already starting to slow and sink. Increase in dead zones. This is from Britain Independence. We're starving the world seas. The dead zones are spreading everywhere. Uh, Britain faces big chill as ocean currents slow. No, I'm serious. Okay, so we may have a climate collapse behind this panic. Well, the Gulf Stream is now already slowing. Talking about the climate for a moment. I'm from Los Angeles where we had more rain this year than you did. 
Is there anything wrong with this picture? We had 35 inches of rain in Los Angeles. What? Yeah. I mean, holy gamoli, what's going on here? How many people are parents of, related to, or are themselves males between the age of 18 and 30 who are eligible for the draft next year? How many people here are between the ages of 18 and 30? Your prime age is for draft, and women are, are, are not excluded right now. We told you the draft was coming back. It is coming back. We're going to be fighting all over the world. Everybody's already moving to fight all over the world. Backdoor law, backdoor draft. God bless Stan Goff. I feel so sorry for guys my age, 54 years old reservists who have been stuck in Iraq, guard and reservists who have been stuck in Iraq for up to a year and a half, some for two years under stop loss. Army reserves becoming broken force. How many of you follow? You've got an Army reserve guy just refused his second deployment to Iraq. You see that story? God bless him. We already have a backdoor draft, but now we have a backdoor draft in the form of stop loss. Guard and reservists are being held over. Enlistees now thinking they got a three-year term of enlistment at the pleasure of the president and may now be forced to serve on active military duty until they're 53 years old. Yeah! And guess what? The draft is coming back because Charlie Rangel, Bill Clinton's best buddy, has just reintroduced the draft bill last week. It's coming. And don't think you can flee to Canada. No. This ain't Vietnam, ladies and gentlemen. Canada's already sending AWOLs back to the States. There's like, there's like 40 FBI offices scattered throughout Canada and under the legislation after 9-11, there is no, Canada will ship them right back because we will kick Canada's ass if they hide American draft dodgers again. You want to flee the country? We have smart borders. They're now monitoring who leaves the country. Draft age guys trying to leave the country may not be allowed to leave. No fly list. You know the U.S. Army just got caught trying to, they had signed up a guy who was a certified hospitalized manic depressive to put him in the infantry. I, I, I have seen unmedicated manic depressives. I don't want that guy to have a machine gun when he goes one way or the other. The draft is coming, but if the economy collapses totally, people are unemployed, and everybody of draft age or military age is out of work, and people are starving on the streets, and the military says, hey, I'll give you a bed job, three hots and a cot, come on. Maybe that's another way around the draft. So be prepared. The draft is coming back. We'll move on to Mike Rupert. This is going to be a difficult question for me, and I'm going to have to wind up beating up on my dear friend Cynthia McKinney because she's the only sitting member anywhere of the United States Congress who was in this room today. Why? Um, we've heard some really, really disturbing things here today. Some things weren't even mentioned. I want to thank Mr. Michaels for referring to the fact that, was it how many, four or five states, and uh, God knows how many cities now have passed resolutions opposing the Patriot Act. Uh, the United States has thumbed its nose at the uh, International Criminal Court at The Hague. We've basically told them, we don't care who you indict here. We're not going to let you talk to any of our people, and how do we expect the world to behave like that? Uh, the, it, it's very interesting that the Patriot Act was already drafted before the 9-11 attacks occurred. That's a, you know, 9-11 is the watershed moment that has opened the door to everything else that has followed, and that's why it's so important to understand the significance of 9-11 above and beyond. Nobody mentioned total information awareness uh, and, and the absolute violation of any privacy we have with respect to all of our personal records and its attachment to Promise software, which is out of the, it's a matter of record that the software exists that can data mine every aspect of our lives on an almost real-time basis. We've seen uh, portions of the first, fourth, fifth, sixth, and eighth amendments to the bill of, to, to the Constitution uh, either abrogated totally or partially. 
uh, since 9-11. And where I have to hold Congress to blame is, is that there was a state of emergency declared on 9-11, and it is a statutory obligation of the Congress of the United States to meet after 60 days to review that state of emergency and grant the statutory authority for so many of the violations, especially with respect to the military tribunals. Uh, which have taken place overseas. And to my knowledge, Congress has not once met to even discuss that state of emergency. And this is why I am at a point. I mean, I've been walking these halls, and this is going to be a jump ball question. Like, I'm going to throw the basketball in the air, and I'll bet you it hits the ground because nobody wants to touch it. Okay? Uh, I've been walking these halls since 1979, and I first came to Congress looking for help because my life was in danger. That was a lot more real to me than some academic discussion. I was a whistleblower with LAPD. I needed help from Congress because I caught my government doing something wrong. I've been walking these hills every year since. And I'm sorry, but I see a dissent, and you have described, if you will, a disease state of a republic, whatever you want to call it, descending. And this is a historical question for anybody who wants to take it. Any of you historians out there, have any of you ever seen a nation or an empire at the pinnacle of power, whether it be Rome, France, Spain, Britain, anywhere else, descend down a road to totalitarianism and on its own voluntarily decide to turn around? I, for one, am extremely skeptical and, you know, I, I, this is the bravest woman on Capitol Hill of all the members I've ever met sitting right up there. But, but I have to ask, there's a lot of Americans who are scared. There's a lot of Americans who don't buy what's going on. There's a lot of Americans who are worried their sons and daughters are going to be drafted. There's a lot of Americans who are going to be worried about waking up. At, we are waking up in a totalitarian state. And we're trying to throw them a bone here. Which, and I don't see much meat on the bone we're throwing them today. So historically, what hope do you have that we are going to be able to turn any of this around, and please do not give me or any of the American people some, you know, a platitude response about we can write letters and have hearings and all this stuff. This is the only woman who's put her life, her career, she had a two-year vacation and had to come back, okay, thanks to a lot of people in this room, okay. We want some action. We want, how optimistic are you that we are going to do any of this? Ms. Musa, um, could you it, begin to answer that? Our rights are ours. The government does not give us our rights. Jefferson tells us that our rights belong to us from the time that we're born. The government's job is to recognize and guarantee those rights. And when the government's not doing its job, it's the government that's on the defensive, not the public. Those rights, therefore, cannot be taken away. They can only be surrendered. And we have to be very careful about what rights we're surrendering, because I do agree with you that there is a point at which we will not get back what we have surrendered. How many people in the room are upset, concerned, worried, and personally affected by rising oil prices, gas prices, heating oil, natural gas to heat your home? We all realize, some of us realize, that attitudes must be changed and forgive humanity is to even partially meet the challenges that are in our faces. So 9-11 is gone, but learn from it. That's why you need crossing the Rubicon. That's why you need that economic map that goes back before 9-11 and afterwards that gives you the map of this landscape. That's what's coming. Before every major collapse of a civilization were currency devaluation and soil degradation. Collapses of civilizations happen. Do not say it can't happen here. In November 2002, James Kenneth Galbraith wrote an article titled The Unbearable Cost of Empire. None of these problems will be cured so long as war remains our dominant political theme. But serious though they are, they pale in comparison with the larger problem of the international trade and financial order under conditions of permanent war. It is a straightforward fact that if global oil production starts to decline, with U.S. consumption does not, everyone else will be required to cut purchases and uses of oil. But how can oil prices be held stable for Americans and made to rise for everyone else? Only by a policy of continuing depreciation of everyone else's currency. Such a policy of dollar hegemony and the worldwide financial instability of crushing debt burdens and deflation throughout the developing world is perverse. It 
will make our trading partners exports cheap, render their imports dear, and keep their real wages low. It will price American goods out of the world markets and lead to unsustainable dependence on foreign capital. It will be a policy, in short, of beggar all of our neighbors while we live alone in increasing idleness inside a dollar bubble. This is the policy that Bush and Cheney are, are imposing on the rest of the world, but they cannot make it last. It will make lives miserable elsewhere, generating ever more resistance, terrorism, and military management. My critics have accused me of being an advocate of genocide. No. The scientific fact is the planet could carry two billion people before oil. It can't carry two billion, six and a half on the way to nine when the oil runs out. A die-off is inevitable. I do not have a plan for how to deal with overpopulation, which is, to sum up, probably the single biggest issue here. But I guarantee you that Dick Cheney, David Rockefeller, the Queen of England, George Bush, and the financial George Soros, the financial elites of the world do have a plan, and that's what scares the crap out of me. When an empire breaks up, power decentralizes. To rephrase that, survival will become a local issue. They're transferring the wealth. What are they doing? They're taking care of the elites. They're all getting ready for peak oil, and they're going to leave you to hang or survive locally. This is now a matter of survival, and not everybody's going to make it. And I have made the decision with these five rules that I'm going to put back up here as, as, as I shut up and conclude here. I have made the decision, like I had to do a couple of times as a policeman at a scene of a fire, uh, and once at the scene of a major shooting, where I understand that not everybody's going to make it. One, there is no combination of alternative energy sources anywhere that will enable current consumption and growth to continue. Period. Two, even if there were, it takes 30 years and lots of capital investment to change an energy infrastructure. Peak oil is here now. Three, no government entity, federal or state, will do or be able to do anything to solve peak oil and energy shortages. The political system is broken. Four, until you change the way money works, you change nothing. It will be more profitable to let decline, starvation, wars, disease, and famine occur than it will be to prevent them. Disaster capitalism. Five, all real solutions will be place-based, local, and originate at the grassroots independent of government. What saves you will be determined by what and who is in your own neighborhood and what kind of cooperation has been achieved there. Survival will become a local issue. And nobody, no grandfather, no Santa Claus, no George Bush, no Hillary Clinton, no nobody is going to come bail you out of this problem. What are my priorities for post-petroleum living? Low population density outside of a major metropolitan area. The last place I want to be when the food shuts off or there's a permanent blackout is like in Los Angeles with 13 and a half million people in a basin with four ways in and out, no fresh water, and a two-day food supply. Geography, whether it has to do with whether you live in Portland or Eugene or Ashland or Bend or Salem or Springfield, is going to determine everything. You're not going to get your food from Idaho or Chile or any place else. It's going to come from here in the future society. So people are waking up and they are doing what needs to be done and they're doing it outside of the paradigm. So I encourage you to get active locally here. Go to your town hall, go to your city council, go to, your, go to Jackson County, go to wherever you got to go and you start demanding that this get on the agenda. Good news. An Australian politician and the deputy prime minister in Australia is now on record about peak oil, alerting their citizens. Congressman Roscoe Bartlett has made two presentations on the floor of Congress. Don't expect legislation, but he's getting the word out. And I'm going to be meeting with him in Washington next month. And now, locally, all over the country, local cities and towns are having meetings on peak oil, realizing this, saying, what the hell do we do? Willits, California is already halfway off the grid. They're already halfway checked out of the political system. All right? All over this state, biodiesel co-ops are forming. Organic farming, permaculture, which is a great hope for mankind. Permatopia is, you know, there are solutions, but they're all springing from the grass roots. You've got to be prepared to do it like my 
grandparents did, my, my, great, my grandparents did during the Great Depression. Neighbor took care of neighbor. You dealt with local food growing because globalization is dead. The 10,000 mile Caesar salad is gone. We ain't gonna have any more strawberries from Chile, okay? Uh, because the transportation fuel will not be available to bring it. Food production will revert to local. So look into permaculture, look into local, support, stop spending your money at Walmart or any other corporation that takes profit. It, it, it's the things we find hard to let go of that hurt us, that slow us down. Uh, it, it's, it's thought patterns and everything else, but letting go is the measure of achieving survivability. It's achieving flexibility. It's achieving adaptivity. Before every major collapse of a civilization were currency devaluation and soil degradation. Collapses of civilizations happen. Do not say it can't happen here. You hear opponents or the critics of peak oil, the guys who are trying to keep the stock market bubble afloat, stocks afloat, uh, and trying to keep you ill-informed Ill about what's going on, uh, will argue that science and technology will solve everything. The, war the Stone Age didn't end because the world ran out of stones. It ended because we found better things to do. Iron. Okay, well that is totally fallacious reasoning. We call these people the flat earth economists who believe that by throwing money at any problem you can find a solution. And here's the really bad misconception. The misconception is if you're gonna be a pure activist you have to be poor, you can't charge. You have to give it away for free. Well, I was poor for 30 years. The CIA made me homeless and bankrupt. There's no sin in making the living changing the world. There's no sin in being able to eat and pay your rent and go to sleep at night without worrying if the power is going to be shut off tomorrow because activists who eat and who get sleep and who have a place to live and who know that they can pay their, put gasoline in their car for however long we have it, tend to do much better work than activists who are starving, hungry, and poor. It's the Rockefellers who have sold activists on the notion that you need to be poor and that's for the precise purpose of making you ineffective. The work that we do is valuable to each other, and we give each other energy that way. In 2001, when I spoke at Portland State University on my video, Truth and Lies of 9-11, that it's also on the DVD, I made a vow. And the vow was, you keep subscribing to my newsletter, you keep buying my products, and I will keep bringing you better information. And I've kept that vow, and I'm still living in the damn same single apartment I was living in then. I spend my money in the activist community. That's the way we have to learn how to fight with our money the way they fight. And that's why you've got to really spend your money with all the people out here. Now let's say you all are the people who actually know the Titanic is going to sink. And you're faced with the people who say, something's wrong, I don't know what to do, somebody help me, show, show me what to do. Then there's another group of people who are hysterical. Oh my God, the ship's been hit, and you try to talk to them, but they won't listen to you, they're in denial. Everything will be fine. Then there's another group that says, this ship is unsinkable, I'm going back to the bar for a drink. Which group of people would you expend your time and energy trying to help build life rafts? The only people we want to reach now, if we want to be effective in saving lives, are the people who understand that the Titanic is sinking, not the ones who are on their, on their way back to the bar to have another drink. Okay, we save the ones who want to save, but we can save lives with the knowledge that we create. Thank you very much. And it's an elite above the White House that is driving this careening car and taking this planet off a cliff. And I need friends. I need help. We all need each other. Those of us who understand that in the ham and eggs breakfast, we're the pigs, it's about time we started doing something. Thank you for having me, Cal Scott. I just want you to know that um, uh, I'm scared. Uh, I'm scared because I don't have a clear picture of what's going on. All I know is that the maniacs, the, the, the lunatics, are not only running the asylum. I'm convinced they want to kill billions of people, but I'm also convinced, kind of like...
Jeff Goldblum in uh, Jurassic Park, where he talks about the law of unintended consequences, you know, uh, that these guys, uh, Catherine Austin Fitz's line is great, those who win in a rigged game get stupid. These guys are really stupid. Uh, and we are in a lot of danger, and I cannot leave you with any other words that are more, most important for me to c communicate to you except for prepare, prepare, prepare. But from the wilderness now has a new motto. Denial stops here. Because only when you're out of denial can you do anything to save your friend, anybody else on this planet. I want all of you to see what so many people are seeing, and I want all of you to begin to let go of the things you need to let go of so that you can find the things. You can't put something new in a hand that's holding on to something. You've got to open the hand before you can get a solution in there. So you've got to start to let go. You've got to start to think. You've got to start to ask the right questions, and you've got to stop convincing, trying to persuade yourself that it's all going to get better because it isn't. I want you to live, and I want you, knowing what you have learned here, to help somebody else to live. And that's the way we justify the existence of the human race. Portland, I love you. Thank you very much. While this video was in post-production, the U.S. was devastated by two major hurricanes in what was to become the deadliest hurricane season in history. Katrina and Rita devastated U.S. energy production and left some 60% of U.S. oil production and more than 75% of U.S. natural gas production stranded in the Gulf of Mexico for what may be years to come. Societal and economic collapse may prevent a full recovery to what were already inadequate levels of energy production. The storms only added to my personal conviction that the winter of 2005-2006 was going to be as big an historical landmark as was September 11, 2001. As a result of the hurricanes, U.S. military recruiters found it easy to meet their goals from the crowded, dirty, and desperate floors of the Superdome and the Astrodome. The draft has been forestalled, for a while at least. Then we made a startling discovery. From Washington to Oregon to Vermont to Ohio to North Carolina to New York and Tennessee, perhaps tens and even hundreds of thousands of people have been paying attention to the many activists who have been working for so long without any payoff or acknowledgement. A great change is underway. Biodiesel co-ops are forming. Localized organic food production and distribution is being encouraged. Backyard food gardens are being planted. Even place-based stock co-ops are being formed at the county level to finance changes that will mean survival for hundreds of thousands, if not millions. Food resources are being mapped locally. The town of Willits, California is actively preparing for peak oil and local sustainability as are many other small towns in the Pacific Northwest. People are taking the knowledge being put out by guerrilla news reporting and they are experimenting, improving, refining and choosing options to enhance the survivability and quality of life in harmony with the specific requirements of the places where they live. How widespread is this awakening? We don't know yet. These changes are not being reported by large news organizations or in government reports. They're happening because a change in consciousness is taking place. New ways to find and report on these trends must be developed to increase our collective learning speed. From the Wilderness will have to change its research style to identify and report on these developments. It will require travel and networking at a whole new level. A whole new culture is being born. The gloom I felt as the winter approached has been replaced by a new optimism and energy. Kindred spirits and new knowledge are out there to be found. 
the watchword for the next stage of human evolution has been identified, sustainability. Indeed, there is now no higher human calling. We are not alone. We, the paradigm shifters. We, the map makers. Forget me, I'll fade from your memory And that's how it should be You won't need me now The world will embrace you And lovers will chase you Their kisses will take you Where I could never go well, I never change, I'm forever the same hope you call out my name when you need me and someday you'll be young again and we'll play like we did back then and fly far away you and I my friend someday when Sad memories fade till you need them And someday when you're young again We'll play like we did back then And fly far away You and I, my friend Someday when you're young 